Finance Committee and at this stage if there's any declarations of interest, financial or otherwise, related to today's proceedings, now is the appropriate time to declare it. If not, then we shall uh, proceed. If members are content, we'll um, have the oral evidence sessions on the protection from stalking bill reported by Hansard as well, so everyone's content. Content. With apologies from uh, Gordon, Emma and Rachel hopes to join us later by starting as does uh, Paul Frew, um, and then we've got other members uh, joining us via the Starley facility, and you're all very welcome. If I can ask the clerk to advise if any delegation of votes. Under Standing Order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairperson, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. So the draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 6th of May, um, if members are content that they're a true reflection of the proceedings, then I can sign them off. Members are content. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's currently no matters arising, so we'll move into the main part of today's business, which is the oral evidence session on the stalking bill. Um, so, members, there is a, a summary of the key issues and proposed changes that have been raised in the written evidence received on the protection from stalking bill, pages 3 to 19 of your table pack. And so members may wish to refer to this and explore then the relevant issues during the oral evidence sessions today. Uh, we have representatives from the police service um, and they will be attending the meeting to provide uh, their oral evidence and a copy of the police's written submission is on pages 16 to 18 of the meeting pack. So just as uh, officials are taking their seat, I'll uh, formally welcome uh, Detective Chief uh, Superintendent Anthony McNally, who head off uh, public uh, protection branch uh, community safety department and detective chief inspector uh, Lindsay Fisher um, again public protection branch uh, from the police service of Northern Ireland so you're both uh, very welcome thank, uh, you, thank you for coming um, we'll record this by hand so our transcript will be published in due course and uploaded to the web page so I'm going to hand over um, to detective chief superintendent McNally at this stage and then we'll follow up with some questions sure. Bear with me. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, members, for your time here today. So, um, we have submitted our response to the department in relation to the the stock and bill as drafted, and um, as per our report, we very much recognise that this is um, a good piece of legislation in terms of strengthening the architecture to um, prevent victimisation um, and deal with offenders in Northern Ireland for stalking, be that in a domestic or a non-domestic setting. Um, we are um, satisfied with the construction um, of the bill um, as it is, save for a number of small points which we have highlighted to the Department of Justice um, officials in our return. Chair, would you like me to talk you through those? or If you want to just go, go over briefly your, your submission, yeah. Yeah, sure. So firstly, in terms of um, Clause 7, in respect of the, the application for orders, so um, most of the points that I would highlight, I should say for you, maybe to give you a bit of a sort of a, of a summary if you want, most of the points that we would wish to highlight are very much around the operationalisation of the bill, things that we will need to know and understand in terms of how whenever police officers look to, to deal with this on the ground, if you will, and that we have absolute clarity uh, of understanding of those. So most of the, our submission are based around those points. Um, there are three sort of broad areas um, that I think are important to highlight to the committee that police are aware of uh, and would like to be uh, considered in terms of further conversation with the department. Firstly, is around the guidance, the guidance that will, of course, help us operationalise that, like the domestic abuse bill, as there are similarities. We'd be very keen to make sure we have substantial guidance, and I know the department have committed to work with that with us, um, and we welcome that. Secondly, um, is training, and um, there will be uh, a significant training requirement for police in, uh, in respect of this bill, um, also, and again, similar to the domestic abuse bill. Um, so it is important that we work collaboratively, both within justice but also external to justice, as to how we make sure that we are collectively providing the protection that victims will deserve, and indeed this bill is designed to deliver. 
The third point is in relation to costs. Um, any new legislation does come with a, with a financial cost. And of course, as I highlight, the overarching uh, desire of policing is to keep people safe and put a prevention first ethos in place. But to do so, to enable to act, enact any new legislation, there will be training requirements. For example, also the uh, stocking protection orders, a fantastic tool, but again, those things will uh, do come with uh, a financial tail. And it's just important that we highlight that that is important to police and that we do not want to fail by not being able to properly use the legislation due to financial constraints, that that is a, a consideration um, throughout this process. So in terms of our uh, specific points in relation to uh, Clause 7, you will see that we have highlighted again just a, a minor point, but it talks about the Office of Chief Constable and um, being able to apply for orders. We just need absolute clarity that that means any constable operating under the Office um, of Chief Constable. So again, that can be covered in the guidance or the legislation. Um, we are we have raised the point uh, in relation to the the legislation talks about um, the police taking out an order if someone is resident in Northern Ireland or is intent on travelling to Northern Ireland for the purposes of stalking. But when one considers the cyber stalking arena, what is the considerations when the victim is in Northern Ireland but the perpetrator is outside of Northern Ireland? And therefore, when you apply that legislation as written, we can't take out a stalking order um, or an interim run. So we would welcome some discussion um, around how that could be progressed um, and making sure that we provide the utmost safeguards for victims who are resident here. Um, in Northern Ireland. And does the bill assist on that, or does it need strengthened to cover the cyber stalking issue? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that it's specifically around the cyber stalking issue, or or more about the practicalities of where orders can be yeah. can be taken out. So, um, I know that the department have committed to having further conversation on this, but that's something we would highlight to the to the committee um, yeah. also. Uh, in terms of clause eight, um, the power to make orders um, again. I suppose a similarity is in respect of non-molestation orders, which can, as the committee will know, be taken out ex parte. So effectively, um, the uh, suspected offender may not be present at court, but when the order is granted, the order becomes live and potentially out with that individual's knowledge. So we just seek clarity that there is similarity um, in that respect. Obviously, again, that's something we would welcome, that the order doesn't have to be served on an individual for it to become live in order to better safeguard the victim. That's something we would ask is, is considered. Um, in terms of Clause 14, um, in relation to notification requirements, there are some points here that we would like to draw out. Um, firstly, um, when we talk about the address, um, there is a comparator here to the public protection arrangements where individuals may not necessarily have a permanent address and they may reside overnight in certain locations and there are specific notification requirements um, around those issues where we have had some legal challenge around how those are addressed. So we would ask that there's some further consideration to cross-reference in those with the public protection arrangements in terms of how we navigate our way through difficult scenarios when people who are perhaps more transient in lifestyle and do wish to stay away for um, a short period of time, how we, how we manage those that sit out with um, their permanent address. It is an area we have um, faced challenge on before, as I've said. Um, also under this area, uh, we do talk about uh, if... Uh, an order is taken out in relation to notification requirements. But I suppose, again, when one considers reference to the public protection arrangements, when a sexual um, offences protection order is taken out, there are further than notification requirements. There are monitoring requirements in terms of those are managed through the agencies involved in the public protection arrangements. So we have asked for clarity around what is the consideration within those. Is it the view of the, the department that those will come in within the public protection arrangements? And if so, how are we going to, to manage those? Because again, um, you will be aware, I'm sure, Chair, as well, the committee members, this is something through Amendment 73 has been subject to significant um, conversation within the, the UK bill um, as it's been making its way through um, government over there. And it's something that I think we should cross reference in terms of considerations here for Northern Ireland. Um, also linked to that um, is in respect of um, then the, the public protection arrangements and any changes to um, the Article 50, which governs the arrangements um, of those. Um, also then in respect of 
uh, the orders themselves. Uh, they quite rightly, and it's very good that they mention that people may be compelled to do certain things. So, for example, I note in the Hansard of 21st of January, one of those considerations was a suggestion that someone subject to an order may, under have to take, may have to undertake a health course, for example, be that for some form of addiction. Again, that sounds entirely a sensible approach, but the operationalisation of that. So from a policing point of view, if that is something we wish to place within a, an order, what if that course isn't available or if that course isn't available for a period of time? How do we link in with health partners and whoever the, the administers of that course might be to make sure that those things are addressed? Um, and also, if someone is undertaking such a course, if they fail to continue with it um, or don't turn up, who is the onus on in respect of the enforcement of the order? Is it on the body who they're supposed to be attending to notify police that they haven't attended, or is it for police to check? So again, around the orders, there are some very specific operational things that I believe we need to work through in terms of either the guidance or the legislation, because, as I say, from a policing point of view, we want to make sure that we absolutely um, are using this to the greatest tool to protect some of the most vulnerable um, in society. So that's my opening comments, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, that's helpful, and I picked up on one. I just was wanting to find out in terms of the kind of online harassment, if you think the bill adequately covers that, or if there's more that can be done on it. So you you did pick up on that, and feel free to to pick up on it again. In addition, then just around you mentioned with this new legislation comes additional resources required and so on. So has there been any conversation around? quantifying what a cost would be or the kind of investment that would be needed? Yeah, so I, I think that's something that, that, that does need to be picked up again. And I have spoken to the department, I've spoken to Brian Grismick, who was here obviously with yourselves in January, and we're due to meet next week around those things. So certainly from a, a policing point of view, we're aware, as you will be, that the, the, the uptake, for example, of the orders, the stocking orders, has been patchy, arguably, um, in England and Wales, as people um, get used to them in the first year. Our estimation is that there's somewhere around £800 in order in terms of when you add up the associated costs. So, but because it's a reasonably new piece of legislation, um, it's difficult to really mm. quantify what um, financially the, the impact of that might be in totality for policing. But nonetheless, I think it's a conversation, something that, that needs to be scoped out. And you yourself are quite rightly mentioned the, the cyber aspect mm. to it. So um, again, it's a new piece of legislation. So if, for example, uh, an offence is solely committed online in terms of someone is cyber stalking on the, the two or more occasions. The, the, the requirements around the cyber infrastructure will be greatly impacted upon mm. in it with something new. Um, so that's something again that, we'll, that we need to try to, to be certainly mm. be at least aware of, if not be able to, to make some quantifiable assessment of, of those costs and impacts. Not least financial impacts, but time, yeah. because the more volume in the system, then sometimes the longer these things can take. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll bring in some members, and then I might come back later. Um, but some of the other colleagues might pick up on them. So, if I can bring in Linda Dillon, the vice chair of the committee at this stage. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you to Anthony and, and Lindsay for coming to the committee today. The chair has kind of covered one of my questions, which is in relation to the the resource aspect, and I suppose just to to tease that out a wee bit, if we, if we were talking about PSNA being responsible in, in a monitoring capacity, then that would obviously have further resource implications. Or do you include that, Anthony, within what you've just said around the £800? I'm thinking not, but I just want to clarify that. And then well, maybe if Anthony wants to respond to that just quickly first, and then I'll go on to the other point. Yeah, so uh, the monitoring requirements were not part of that consideration, just for clarity. That was around the administration in relation to a stocking order in itself as a specific thing. But mm -hmm. yes, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm aware from the committee's perspective around the, the monitoring requirements within the domestic abuse bill, and I, I imagine that may be something similar that you would look to, to have here. Um, and yes, of course, that will, does require, that is additional demand within policing, but obviously something if the you know, committee is minded to do, well, that's what we'll do, but I would be keen to, to have those conversations conversations with the department around um, the, yeah. the long term. No, I accept that, Anthony, and I think it's fair enough that you would expect resourcing in relation to that, and you're right to the committee, and 
um, I'll not speak for others, but it, it was very important for us in the domestic abuse bill, and it's not going to be any different in, in relation to the, the stalking legislation. It's it's really important because you know all of this is what feeds into how we move forward and what we should be doing differently. Um, just the, the other aspect then, and the chair's already addressed the the, the cyber end of it to a degree, but um, just obviously in, in relation to the practical difficulties that you've already outlined about around the fact of somebody who is the um, alleged perpetrator is not living here, but the victim is, and they're you know they're per- perpetrating that stalking from an, another jurisdiction. How how do we deal with it? And you've obviously flagged it up, but are there any examples of how this has been addressed in relation to other crimes? And is is there a practical way that we can, I suppose the simple question is, is there a practical way that we can put this into the legislation to address it or put it, you know, have it, even if it's not, doesn't need to go in the legislation, how we can address it? I just, I'm, I'm looking for an answer on how we could address that if you have one. And if you don't, Anthony, that's fair enough. Then we have to ask the department how they're going to deal with it because we can't have a circumstance where somebody is a victim of someone who is outside of this jurisdiction and we, we're just throwing our hands in the air and saying, well, we can't do anything about it. And I'm very conscious of the fact that the people who suffer as a result of that in terms of public perception are the PSNA and it's something that I've raised before and, and I will say again, we need to make sure the legislation is right for yourselves as well because where we don't give you legislation to act under, then it suddenly becomes the public perception that PSNA are not addressing their needs. And it's very difficult to for to make the public understand that actually you don't have the legislative cover and that's our responsibility as legislators. So I want to make sure that we get this legislation right for the victims and we'll only get it right for the victims if we get it right for yourselves in terms of what you can deliver and what you are able to do in terms of those alleged perpetrators. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, certainly, in terms of, um, I suppose, in terms of context, we, we know the legislation is, is is very good in respect of the fact that um, it permits us if someone is in Northern Ireland or we, is intending to travel to Northern Ireland. So that is a reasonably good um, caveat, and, and one would naturally assume um, that you know more often than not, um, as the evidence shows us that, that stalking does take place. You know, as has been said before. It's not just you know high-profile media figures. Actually, a lot of it can be within a, a domestic relationship, or certainly people know each other. So I suppose you know the circumstances of such a scenario I accept are probably in the minor as opposed to the majority. But nonetheless, it is something that we have flagged as something that we want to look at. It is something we're looking at. I don't have the answer yet, but it's certainly something through our, our legal teams. That we'd be very keen to look at, and certainly something I w- will pick up in conversations myself with the, the department next week. You're just on mute there, Linda. Sorry, I, I muted myself before I said thank you. Thank you, Chair. That, that's all my questions for now. Great, thanks, Linda. Um, Sinead Bradley. Just not picking you up, Sinead, at the minute. You have been brought into the spotlight. Um, Sorry. Yep, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, both Anthony and Lindsay. Um, Anthony, the presentation, I have to say, has given an answer to a lot of the um, questions that I did have to ask. And I I was, and I had noted uh, the point that Linda just raised, in terms of, and it was cited here earlier, the legislation can, a conviction could be brought exclusively on the grounds of online stalking. And then you quite correctly point out that the bill is limited um, in terms of the application for order to resident in or traveling to Northern Ireland. So that is a huge contradiction, I suppose, in the objective of the bill to my mind. And Linda asked the question, and um, it was a similar one that I wanted to ask, if there were any other examples in legislation or anything that you're aware of on an operational level where you perhaps do have powers um, to to gather information or to work with other authorities 
um, to gather information. And, and the one thing I was considering was fraud, online fraud. And I know there has been great efforts um, within the PSNI to, to manage that. And I just wonder, is there, is there anything perhaps in that field that might shine a light to something or be part of an answer as to how we get over this anomaly? Um, and like Linda said, you know, appreciate that you mightn't have that today, but, um, and that we will have to, you know, but you have very ably um, um, marked it up for us. And I think it's a huge, huge gap that we have to close on this. Thank you, Chair. So, um, I mean, we, we have looked at, at other things, such as the, the application of non molestation orders and things, and how they can, can work beyond um, jurisdictions. And obviously, with a, a land border, you're quite right that there are other examples of extra jurisdictional powers, but it was just specifically around this. It's something that, that we have flagged up in terms of something we want to get our heads around, around how we, we don't let victims down. But, but, Lindsay, can I maybe just ask yourself in terms of, I know you have had more recent conversations with the department but myself, but is it, was there any other examples that you're aware of that, that I'm not in respect of? Um, not in respect of, of where we're, we're using additional powers, other than our cross-jurisdictional powers, as, you, as you've mentioned. Um, it, it does obviously allow us to look at um, collecting evidence from mainland UK, because obviously cyber can happen you know, outside of Northern Ireland, so we would be, we'd be following those normal protocols. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Thank you. And Chair, could I just ask um, one more thing? It was about um, the piece about where it cited the Chief Constable. I didn't fully follow that. Um, if you could just run me over that again, you were saying that the legislation cites the Chief Constable, um, and I think you were looking for a broader definition. Is that right? Yeah, so Clause 7, Anthony, you had mentioned that it references the Chief Constable, so that's just ensuring uh, Chief Constable means... PSNI as an organisation, so any constable has the power. Yeah, it was just an any constable query, okay. um, which can be covered in the, in the guidance, I would have thought, possibly. Yeah, so we, we, I've, I've taken note of that, and that is something we'll check to make sure the legislation doesn't mean it's only the chief constable, and well, that makes sense. To, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Uh, Doug Beattie? Uh, thank you, um, Chair, and th thank you, Andy. I mean, that's really useful. Can I, can I just ask, I mean, you, you haven't put very many points down there. It, it seems that you seem to be really quite happy with uh, the, the, the proposals that's been put forward in regards to the stalking bill, um, and that means you can make a, a very easy transition from what you're doing now. Could you maybe just explain what do you do now with something similar to this? Is it, do, do we have a harass harassment laws which actually will morph into stalking protection orders or well, how, how do they how do you, how do we move from from what you're doing now to what is proposed yeah so firstly you're right we have raised a small number of points and that's largely due to the fact that there has been good consultation with the, the department on ourselves in respect of the bill and we are broadly content with it um how, how i see it is in terms of strengthening the architecture so if you take where we were um and, and actually possibly still are you have harassment as really the, the primary sort of piece of, of legislation in, the, in this arena. The fact that we will have a domestic abuse bill with a very specified offence and the fact that we will have a stalking bill with a very specified offence actually does two things for me. It strengthens our ability to protect victims and deal with perpetrators, but it actually provides clarity. One of the challenges that the policing has faced is where stalking behaviours may have been present. We have tried to use harassment legislation and maybe it just wasn't quite fit for purpose. Um, so therefore, actually, I, I think that's the exact reason why this piece of legislation is required, because it provides clarity and strengthens um, our ability to tackle these things between the harassment bill, the domestic abuse um, bill and the, the stalking bill. Uh, and, and um, is, there, is there any issues that you think, uh, I mean, you mentioned cost, of course, there's cost. Uh, and resource as well. Do, 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 you, do you see that there will be a big cost and resource to what you have at the minute? Do you have the resilience to cover that? Or, or is this something where, you know, with a shortfall in budgets, is it something you're going to be having to flag up again as, as, as another shortfall up that could be in the offing? 
But I think um, in terms of, I think there's a, a bigger conversation required there in terms of the, the, the broader legislation, because we, as we know, this piece of legislation doesn't stand in isolation as other things that will be coming through this committee. So if you consider the miscellaneous provisions bill as it was, I think it's recently changed name, hasn't it? You know, so there are a number of pieces of legislation which I think in the round we should consider in terms of you know, the operationalisation of those and try to understand the, the financial aspect. It may well be that that could be, could be covered as is, but I think certainly it's important that it's flagged to the committee and it's something that the, the senior executive team within PSNI will keep a, a watching eye on in terms of what we anticipate the cost to be. But, but it, wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily mean, for example, I mean, if you look at the domestic uh, abuse bill and then you look at this bill and the miscellaneous bill, and there's an awful lot in there, and an awful lot of it says, and the PSMI must go through training in regards to this, yes. It doesn't. It's not likely to have an effect on you know the the, the the whole structural piece of the of the police, including you know that that whole training piece, that phase three training for uh, police officers to just to be able to get up to speed with all of this type of legislation. Yeah, I mean you're right. It is a significant training demand, and of course there is the the, the inbuilt need for um, annual refresher training. I mean you could argue in one sense that's something we would have wanted to do anyway um, in respect of keeping our officers up to speed. But there is no doubt there is a, a, an addition to the to the training environment when it becomes a, a legislative requirement. No, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dirk. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Okay, well I have no more questions. So there may be things that we will tease out in due course that we will want to come back to, to both of you on. I'm sure you'll be happy to, to facilitate us. So can I thank you, Anthony and Lindsay, for, for coming to the committee today. It's much appreciated. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you thank members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we will move on to the next oral evidence session, um, which is from the Human Rights Commission. So pages 20 to 30 of the meeting pack, uh, and also um, pages 31 to 61 are the relevant papers. So we should be getting joined through the Starley facility. Um, yeah. so if I can ask Sarah to mute yourself. Yourself. Hiya. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. If you can just go and mute for now. And, and Les. Uh, hi, Chair. Can you uh, hear me all right? Yes, I can. We're just getting some of you back. So if you can put yourselves on mute. Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, members, there's the, the information in the meeting pack, and uh, I'll formally now welcome Les Allenby, Chief Commissioner, and Sarah Sims, Policy and Research Officer from the Human Rights Commission. We'll uh, report this um, by Hansard and then publish a transcript on the web page. So, I'm going to be inviting uh, Les to outline any key issues in relation to the provisions of the Bill and any gaps or issues that the Commission would want to draw to the attention of the committee, and then members, we will move into a period of questions and discussions. So, um, Les, if I can invite you in, and you can unmute, and if Sarah, you stay on mute just for now, and we'll we'll make sure we don't get the feedback coming round again. Thanks, Les. Chair, colleagues, thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation today. Um, there's two parts really to um, our evidence. I'm going to cover the bill's provisions, and then um, my colleague Sarah will look at the implementation issues. Um, um, this is a bill which uh, helps fulfil the Istanbul Convention, um, which is the Council of Europe Convention on Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. The UK signed the convention in 2012 and has committed to ratifying the convention and reporting on its progress, and we'd like to see a time to timeline for that. Um, and this contributes towards uh, the ratification. And the bill recognizes the fact that the substantial majority of um, victims, but not exclusively so, are women, and the substantial majority of men, uh, per perpetrators rather, are men. Uh, the Commission responded to the consultation document and the bill itself 
And we do welcome the fact that the many of the Commission's recommendations have been incorporated into the bill, including um, a wide ranging definition of what constitutes stalking, uh, the recognition of cyber stalking, uh, and the provision of stalking protection orders. Um, we've raised a few issues with the bill, which we don't think detract from the overall purpose and its value. The first is that the application for a stalking protection order under Section 8 can be made against an individual prohibiting a wide range of, um, of behaviours which is set out in the legislation. But we have a slight concern that while this may prohibit the stalker from behaving in a certain way, it may not prevent him or her um, from using an intermediary to behave in a way designed to continue or threat, uh, threaten or intimidate a victim of stalking. And we know that there is a relationship between coercion and controlling behavior and stalking in many instances. So it's not beyond the imagination that, for example, a perpetrator may use, let's say, for example, in, in an individual case, his controlling influence on someone else to continue the stalking. Um, and we think it should be made clear within the bill that utilizing intermediaries can be added to the behavior which is prohibited. Um, our second issue is um, one that I don't think needs to be dealt with in the bill, but I think probably needs to be dealt with within uh, the guidance, et cetera. And that is the issue of retrospective operation as uh, under Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights, no one shall be held guilty of a criminal offence on, on account of any act which the person did, which would have constituted a criminal act, uh, a not, sorry, con constituted a criminal act at the time it was committed. In other words, you can't offer a heavier penalty than um, was applicable. And we know that stalking can often, as the bill recognises, be a pattern and a conduct of events, some of which may um, span both before and after the legislation, particularly in the early days. And I think we have to recognise from the research that um, the victim often takes considerable time before um, she or he uh, is prepared to um, go to the police or other authorities. Um, I've seen research that suggests almost a hundred kind of acts before somebody finally um, responds by going to, to the authorities in practice. But we think this can be dealt with. Um, we've looked at the uh, CPS guidance. Uh, it makes it very clear that you have to operate uh, in England and Wales on dealing with the acts after this legislation comes into place. But it doesn't. There are ways in which you can take account of, of earlier um, acts by way of bad character, etc. So we think it's it can be dealt with, and we think it would be useful to draw that to the attention of the uh, department. And the third issue, and then I'll pass to my colleague Sarah, is really just the value of post-legislative scrutiny. And we think the committee does a good job, and it's doing it now in terms of pre-legislation, but legislation is only as good as the implementation, and that frankly requires resources for training, public education, support for victim services to work uh, with victims, but also services to help perpetrators understand their behavior and uh, prevent them from doing it again. And it's those kind of implementation issues that we think it would be useful for you as a committee to monitor perhaps in this time 12 months. And it's the useful way in which I can hand the baton on to Sarah to talk about those implementation issues in more detail. So I'll, I'll go on mute and pass you to, to Sarah. Thank you, Les. Sarah. Hi, good afternoon, and um, thank you for inviting us. Um, yes, so as Les has outlined, I'm just going to make a few opening remarks regarding the implementation of the legislation. Um, so as Les has touched on the Istanbul Convention, uh, basically just that policies and programs and additional frameworks and um, monitoring and mechanisms uh, going forward um, with implementation um, of the legislation are aimed at eliminating all forms of gender-based violence against women more widely, therefore in line with the Istanbul Convention. And as the UK is moving towards ratification, um, that Northern Ireland um, should be contributing towards this um, in all aspects, uh, including implementation. 
For example, uh, firstly, this includes ensuring training across the criminal justice system, including um, gender sensitive training um, across judicial and law enforcement officers to work with victims of stalking. Um, this has also been recommended by the UNC Law Committee and referenced within the Dillon Review recommendations, which um, require implementation. Um, we would further recommend awareness raising um, and campaigning around the new legislation, um, including around the offences stalking uh, and cyber stalking, uh, including what constitutes the offence, um, as well as addressing, addressing the wider issue of education around gender-based violence. Um, another matter of implementation would be around data collection. Um, it's important that statistical information um, is gathered and it, it's necessary to identify perpetrators' behaviour and support for victims going forward, um, as well as uh, support for victims more generally. Um, the importance of acknowledging the importance of role, the important role of NGOs in supporting victims and ensuring uh, support is accessible, localised, and officially resourced. Um, and with implementation, there should be steps to ensure the collection of disaggregated data um, on all forms of stalking gather, and this should be gathered and monitored appropriately. Um, and then in regards to perpetrators, that there's appropriate rehabilitation um, of, a, of offenders and addressing recidivism. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I'm going to bring in... Well, I'm going to bring in... If I can bring in, Sarah, would you mind muting? I think the feedback must be coming through your device, so apologies. Um, thank you. Um, if I can bring in Linda Dillon and then Sinead Bradley after that. Linda? Thank you, Chair, and thank you to both Liz and Sarah for their um, remarks. Just, just a couple of, of points. Um, just in terms of the re retrospectivity, Liz, which you, you had raised, and I mean, obviously, we want the best outcomes and the best protection for victims, but we don't want to do anything that would be not be human rights compliant. So we have to always get a balance of those. I'm just wondering, um, is is it outright prohibition or are there are there any circumstances under which it's permissible? And <clears throat> excuse me, just in terms of the offending behaviour then categorised and the offences currently dealt with under harassment legislation and therefore if someone has engaged in offence and harassment behaviour um, which is now prohibited under stalking legislation would that be permissible? Um, and then the SPOs are not criminal convictions so they're, obviously there are protections where police consider an offender to be a, a genuine threat to the, the victim or an alleged offender to be a genuine threat and do the same conditions then in terms of retrospectivity apply and I mean as I've already said we we want to protect victims but we don't want to do that at the expense of um, human rights. Chair if you don't mind I'll let Les answer that because it's, it's quite a bit in one question and, and then I'll come back with a few other short questions. Yeah no problem. Les. Um, yeah, I, I can deal with the first one um, reasonably straightforwardly, which is um, nothing in the retrospectivity would stop PSNI, for example, prosecuting someone under the old legislation, the, the protection from harassment. Um, I think Doug asked earlier about, you know, is this new legislation much better? It is. It's much more forensically focused, clear. It has the advantage of actually naming stalking for what it is um, and I think in terms of public education and people understanding that this behavior can be a criminal offense so um, you can utilize the uh, previous legislation if on the other hand um, it spans both behavior before and after the new legislation which is the reality in many cases if it's not one single event it's been a series of events um, then clearly um, you've got um, a way in which you can utilize the behavior after the uh, legislation coming in. It's how you use some of the earlier behavior. Um, and there are ways, as I say, I think that can be done. And the guidance to the CPS suggests in terms of, of bad character, et cetera. Um, 
I think the question of, and we'd have to go away and look at this, stalking prohibition orders and what happens if the behavior all happened before the new law and then for some reason stopped after the new law, could you, and you were still feeling very um, threatened or unnerved, could you utilize it in, um, in those circumstances uh, where it doesn't create a criminal offense? We'd have to go away and think about that because amongst other things, of course, is if you then do have a stalking prohibition order and if you fail to abide by that order, then you can move into committing a criminal offence. And we know from um, the experience of uh, in domestic violence and uh, orders to prevent domestic violence that they are often breached and therefore there is a kind of continuum to a criminal offence. But I don't have um, a definitive answer to your second question, Linda, I'm afraid. But um, it's one of those which I think the department hopefully will be um, aware of and wise to. Yeah, I appreciate that, Les, and, and thank you. And I suppose I'm trying to bottom these issues out rather than even challenge. So it's, it's, I appreciate your comments around that. So just then, <clears throat> excuse me, around the, you've recommended the, the clarity around the rehabilitation of the offender legislation will apply to all stalking offenders, including whether stalking offences will be a spent conviction or require disclosure for specific employment. So I'm just wondering then, are you aware of any human rights precedents, guidance or recommendations in this area, particularly, in, and you referred yourself to the Istanbul Convention, um, so I suppose specifically in relation to that then, are you aware of any precedents that would? Um, as, as far as I'm aware, I don't think stalking is treated any differently from a number of other offences. And what I mean by that is that they, um, obviously if you were, convicted of a stalking offence, then depending on your sentence would determine how long it is before your conviction is spent. Mm -hmm. As it happens in Northern Ireland, it will be considerably longer than in um, England, Wales and Scotland because um, our legislation is considerably um, uh, less liberal. It hasn't been reformed in, in more than 40 years and we spent last week um, challenging kind of the issue around spent convictions. Um, and of course, uh, our challenge last week, which was about the idea that you could never review somebody's um, conviction over two and a half years, for example, um, four years in, um, in England and Wales and being reformed further um, beyond that. And we also have um, some reform in the pipeline, as you know, in Northern Ireland. Um, but the question of, um, um, there are certain um, forms of employment where you must declare convictions regardless of whether they're spent or not. And I'm assuming, and it, no reason to doubt, but it would be helpful to get clarity that they will have to be declared. So um, work with um, children and young people, for example, where you must declare in certain professions your convictions uh, regardless of, say, of whether they're spent or otherwise. Okay, I appreciate that, Les. And just, I suppose, for more in terms of comment rather than <clears throat> questions to, to either yourself or Sarah, but I mean, you both referred to, and, and particularly Sarah, around the implementation, around the need for training, and I know you had also referred to that, Les, just, I suppose, to give you some reassurance. We will be taking, I have no reason to doubt that we will be taking the same approach to the stalking legislation as we talk to the domestic abuse legislation that the implementation of it is what counts legislation isn't worth the paper it's written on unless the implementation of it's right and unless you actually use that implementation then to gather information to gather data to then decide where resources goes what is the best way to support people going forward what are the best ways to address these issues going forward because any piece of legislation is only as good as the outcomes of it. So, I mean, for us as a committee, and as, as I've said earlier, whenever I spoke, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the whole committee, but I know it was very much a focus of the entire committee in relation to the domestic abuse bill, and I've no reason to doubt that we won't have the same approach to, to this piece of legislation. We're not interested in developing legislation so that we can get a clap on the back and told us told that that's, that's excellent legislation if it doesn't actually have outcomes for people. 
you know, and, and the right types of outcomes. And that's the right outcomes for everybody. You know, I mean, I look here to, to the fact that the, um, the sentences, and this is for, for our next piece, it's actually in, in women's aid response, but the, the maximum sentence, um, for a breach uh, of the SPO is six months within the department's recommendation and you know women's aid are saying it should be 12 months and I'm inclined to almost agree with the maximum and very very seldom do you see a maximum sentence being used to be honest even in the most serious cases in relation to any sentence and for any issue but I, I do wonder if the maximum is six months do you ever give an opportunity to effectively rehabilitate that person or an opportunity to effectively rehabilitate or at least attempt to rehabilitate them. So my my concern around the length of sentence is actually as much on behalf of the, the alleged perpetrator or perpetrator as it is um, around the victim. So no, I appreciate your comments and I just wanted to give you that reassurance around the implementation piece. We as a committee are very, very focused on that to ensure and I know Paul Frew isn't here today but he, he has certainly had a focus on that as well because they've seen previous in, in previous committees legislation not been properly implemented. This is my first time on justice, so I'm hoping we're gonna change that that um type of of non effective legislation being put in place in the future. And and I have given assurances around that that it's something that I'll keep an eye to and that I'll ensure our party does, whether I'm an MLA or on the committee or anything else, I'll I'll always be here, whether they want me or not. <laughs> Thank you, Liz and Sarah. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Great. Thanks. Um, I want to thank Liz and Sarah. Uh, you know, the presentation, but the paper submission has been really helpful. Um, Linda has gone over some of the points as has yourself, Chair, but I suppose I want to focus in on one, I think a very helpful um, observation and submission that's included, and it's the reference um, to the third party, that the behaviour of a third party, and, and Leslie very correctly um, spoke about, you know, the whole coercive nature of um, the individuals that can be involved in these cases and how they might mani manipulate and coerce a third party into um, assisting them in their stalking behaviours. And you helpfully um, highlighted to us the fact that the protection from harassment um, order does include a piece where it, it takes in the, the third party factor. And obviously that will be human rights compliant in the way it does it. And I am just wondering, I would like to hear um, just if you have any other further thoughts you could share with us on that. Because um, if we explore the introduction of that third party, given that we, I suppose, are looking at this in a, in a perhaps a different way than the, hum the, the protection of harassment did, because we're looking at the online aspect as well, and some of those behaviours, you know, even the relationship between the um, the the person who is the stalker and the third party could be quite tenuous. They may not, you know, it could be anonymous accounts and different things. So I think it's maybe not as clean cut as the um, as the protection from harassment may be. And I just would love to hear your thoughts on that. If you have anything further you could add to that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah briefly, it, it's clear, for example, that in terms of stalking protection orders, and it uses this phrase in the explanatory memorandum, it deals with um, stalking by proxy. In other words, that a perpetrator decides to target the person's close friend or family member or someone else as a way of indirectly harassing um, uh, and stalking the individual. But it actually, it's not clear to me whether it covers proxy by stalking. In other words, hypothetically, the stalker who has influence over someone else then asks someone else to start harassing the person um, and effectively if you like is a puppet pulling the string for someone else to whether it's cyber stalking or to start turning up places or to behave in kind of other ways that intimidate and it's not the individual 
who is breaching the order directly because the person may not be directly turning up in places or doing things, but may be manipulating someone else. Um, so I think we'd be keen to make sure that the legislation is clear that that kind of behavior could be covered by any stalking prohi prohibition order. Um, uh, and we're back, I think, and, and that's uh, the point Linda was making about, you know, very welcome point um, around post-legislative scrutiny, etc. For us, a lot of this is about prevention is better than cure. And the more that we can embark on a public legal education so that the general public understand that this kind of behavior can, you know, what its ramifications are, we think is really important alongside training for specialist kind of policing and, and general policing staff, prosecutors and others. Um, so um, that's the one area where we think there is a potential small gap for something to fall through. Thank you. Thanks, Les. Um, and, and I, I think like, I agree with you. I think it's um, a glaring gap. But I'm, what I'm trying to, I suppose, manage is the the legislation that you refer to, you know, and the protection from harassment, which does seem to have covered that space or bridged that gap. But do you believe that what it does is sufficient? Is that the type of model we should be looking to inject into this or given that we have to be mindful of the online world now being a big part of this bill and um, would it need to be scripted in a much tighter way to cover that gap um, we think the bill in terms of uh, outlining the behaviors which are uh, can contribute to um, being unlawful do cover cyber stalking. Um, you know, I heard the again the evidence earlier. There, there clearly is an issue around, and then cyber stalking may apply to this in particular. You could be outside of of Northern Ireland and the UK, and be harassing somebody, uh, stalking somebody, um, and it's going to it's going to be difficult to take action against somebody who's not within you know, ordinarily resident um, um, here. Um, although, of course, if the person then does arrive uh, into the UK or Northern Ireland, um, but we think it does cover cyber stalking and cyber stalking kind of behaviour as well as physical um, and other kinds of um, of behaviour quite effectively. So we, we don't really have issues around the breadth uh, of the behaviour except for where we've raised this. And we're also comfortable with the um, the definition uh, that creates the the offence. We think it's been widely um, and, and effectively drawn, and it has obviously, to some extent, utilised um, work that's been done in in England, Wales, and Scotland, and, and I think legitimately so. Okay, that that's good to know. Thank you, Les, and thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, Gemma Dolan. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Les and Sarah as well. My comment or my question has sort of been answered by Sinead. It was just about the third party. Um, there's a couple of things that hint towards the third party would be covered in the bill, but it's not explicit and it's not obvious. So, Chair, could we write to the department asking for clarity on that or maybe to make it more explicit if it is covered in the bill? We can do, Gemma, yes. That would be no problem. Okay, thank you. Les, can I, can I pick up... Uh, one issue just close to uh, there's been a submission um one of the areas where there's a little bit of concern has been raised by some is the the creation of the offense around threatening or abusive um, potentially being set at a at a low threshold and that could risk restricting freedom of expression um it seems to be lifted from the scottish model um which is unrelated to stalking um and is a more common offense so I'm just keen to, to get a view from you on that. Is that something the Commission have given thought to about this new offence around the threshold and the rights of um, expression? Yeah, yeah um, it, it's something we did think about, but I have to say, I, on balance, when we looked at it, 
we were reassured by the fact that um, Section 2 um, talks about um, to commit an offence, not only does the person have to behave in a threatening or abusive manner, um, the behaviour would likely to cause a reasonable person to suffer fear or alarm, and that the person intends by the behaviour to cause fear or alarm, or is reckless as to whether that behaviour causes fear or alarm. So, so it, general robust, if you like, public or political discourse um, shouldn't readily be be covered. Um, and again, there is a defence that says that a person charged, if he or she can show the behaviour was reasonable in the particular circumstances. So we think there are a number of filters that should allow, um, if you like, this not to become some kind of, have some kind of deadening effect on, on discussion over political or, or personal kind of general disputes that are separate from, um, from this. So um, broadly speaking, I think we're content. Like anything else, we have to see how that applies. The history of um, legislation around protection from harassment, the criticism was really about it was very hard to get um, an action taken and prosecution, not that there were, if you like, um, bordering on specious kind of um, prosecution. So the history to date has not been that this is used as a proxy for closing down public debate that's, that's quite legitimate and sometimes can be quite robust. Okay. Okay, thank you. It's probably something I'll tease out in future um, when the department are before me, but um, can I thank both of you for, for coming and taking the time to, to spend with the committee, and I'm sure if there's anything we want to follow up on, you'll be more than happy to oblige, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, members, um, the next Royal Evidence session um, was due to commence at a quarter past three, so um, we're, we're going to just move on to agenda item seven, and we can work through uh, the rest of the, the agenda, and then we'll come back to um, that oral evidence session whenever Women's Aid are here. So if members are content that I do that, then we'll move on to agenda item seven, which is the damages return on investment bill, and um, it's the proposals for the oral evidence. Um, so the call for written evidence closed on Friday the 30th of April at uh, last week's meeting. The committee agreed to place the written submissions on the committee bill webpage, and then we would consider proposals for all oral evidence sessions at our meeting today. Members also noted that the CBI and Institute and Faculty of Actuaries had requested a short extension to the, time, to the deadline. Uh, both those submissions have now been received and they're included in a table pack, along with a letter from the Lord Chief Justice on the bill on behalf of the judiciary and a letter from the Department of Health, providing a copy of the letter from Minister Swan to the Health Committee on the bill. The Health Committee had already forwarded this letter. Um, these will all be added to the electronic bill uh, folder. The suggestions for the oral evidence session are set out at paragraph 6 of the clerk's memo um, that had also been emailed uh, to members. I'll just open mine up here as well. Um, so if members, um, if you're content in terms of the oral evidence sessions that are outlined in the clerk's memo, um, we can proceed uh, to make the appropriate arrangements unless there's any that you want to remove from the list or propose any additions to it. Uh, otherwise, I'm content with um, how the clerk has, has outlined the oral evidence session should pr proceed. I'll take... Yes, Linda? Chair, I apologise because I was in, in meetings all morning and I haven't actually... I've only got a very quick look. Can, do, do you mind if if Christine just gives us a very quick brief of... Yep. How, how it is intended. Yep, that's no problem, Christine. Do you want to... Sorry, Linda, do you want me to outline the proposals for the evidence sessions or how we intend to manage them? Yeah, but um, the proposals for the evidence sessions. Okay. Um... Oh, sorry, sorry. How, how we intend, like how we're going to take them forward. Okay. Sorry. Um, well, the proposals were set out in the memo. I think the... Um, question for the committee that would be very helpful to us is, first of all, whether you want to complete the stockings 
oral evidence sessions before you start the oral evidence sessions on the damages bill or whether you're content for us to go ahead now um, and start scheduling some of those so that in practice we'll be taking oral evidence sessions on both bills. Um, the oral evidence sessions for next week are settled on the stocking bill but after that we can use the dates that have been identified in the work programme to schedule um, oral evidence on the damages bill as well. We're also so waiting sorry, to explore just whether um, there's a possibility that we may be able to use the Senate chamber um, on a Thursday morning if health decide they're holding virtual um, committee meetings at the minute and there's now a separate uh, live stream for a virtual meeting only. Um, and if that was the case and they were going to move to that so that they could hold longer sessions, that might free up the Senate chamber and we could look to schedule, for example, um, oral evidence sessions in the morning with a break for lunch and then in the afternoon on a Thursday, at least on one of the days, which would also help us to get through a number of them. Um, but we're currently waiting. I'm, I'm trying to explore that with the health clerk as well. So we will look to see, but if you want to schedule the oral evidence sessions that are set out for the damages bill, we will have to look at what options are available to either hold longer meetings um, or additional meetings, just so that we can try and get them all done before summer recess, um, so that we can keep moving on, on both bills. Okay, can I just come in? Can I just clarify, I suppose, I'm not, and, and apologies, I know it's because I haven't had a chance to look at the table papers, so I apologise, but just to clarify then, are we, are we suggesting that we have separate oral evidence sessions from all those 14 outlined who are seeking oral evidence sessions? Is that right? Well, some of them and we've suggested that we might be able to um, put together. So, for example, the CBI did attend the informal meeting with the Forum of Insurance Lawyers, um, and we're suggesting that we go back to them and suggest the same thing. We're also suggesting to put together, if um, assuming the committee wants to hear from the um, insurance firms themselves and not just the bodies that represent insurance firms, that the, there's four insurance firms that would all be asked to come together. Um, I suppose the only issue is then whether we would try to group, for example, were there representatives of the medical associations or the um, medical profession, we could look to ask whether they'd be prepared to attend together. Um, and it's really the preference of the committee. I think. If we're going to do that, what we just need to, I suppose, be cognizant is that quite often when you invite a number of groups to come together, the oral evidence session takes longer um, or slightly longer. Um, but we can, in, this, in the damages bill, if um, the committee would find it useful, we can try and structure the evidence sessions around the questions that were asked that the committee was going to look at. Um, so we could give organisations alternative opportunities if you like to address the question and then anybody else just add something in. So we can look at all of that. I think we were just trying to see first of all how many we were looking or how the, the extent of the evidence you wanted to take on the damages bill and whether you wanted to hear from all of those organisations. Um, if, if that's the case then we will look to see whether we can group or bring some of them in together if that would be helpful. Chair, can I come in on that? Um, I think this is very insurance company heavy, I have to be honest, but um, maybe I'm missing something and, and, I'm, and I'm happy to, to explore that with the other members of the, the committee and, and yourself. But I would be fearful that we're going to spend an awful lot of time listening to the same information from different people. And I know certainly in terms of other legislation, we don't ask individual solicitors to come in, we ask the bar to come in, you know, our representative bodies. And I'm just wondering, is, is this necessary? And if if we do want to, to have those conversations with the um, individual insurance companies, would that be not be more suitable to do as an informal session with the committee? Because this to me just seems like an awful lot for the committee to do in committee time. And I, I'm trying to, I suppose, look to what the staff can do as well. And I can only speak for myself, but on a Thursday morning, it isn't really suitable for me to have to do a committee meeting in the morning and in the afternoon because it's difficult enough to get through our papers 
in the in the set time that we have and and then you know discuss it with your other committee members and and all of that and thrash it out before coming to committee if we had a, a committee meeting in the morning and afternoon i think that would be and, and i'm just being honest and speaking for myself i think i would i would find that a challenge to say the least i'm not ruling it out but i would find it a challenge and I particularly would find it a challenge if, if it was to listen to a number of insurance companies and insurance company representatives potentially saying this with the greatest respect to them all and, and have no issue with listening to them in, in, in an informal setting, but to potentially hearing the same thing repeated from many different individual bodies. And if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm, I stand happy to be corrected. Yeah. No, okay. My, my reading of some of the groups, you, you have those that may be from the insurance industry. Um, there's there's one section there in terms of insurance firms, representatives of a range of different firms that have highlighted. Um, maybe that should be just covered within the forum of insurance lawyers as, as the broader representative group, whether or not, you know, yeah. Okay. Well, why don't you leave it with me again, and I'll go through it with Christine and come back with another paper next week and see if we can um, No, I appreciate that, Chair, sure. and, and, and I'm sorry for, for as I say, I, I didn't get time to, to look at the table paper, so I apologise if I've messed things about a bit, but I no, just okay. want to make sure we've made best use of our, of our time. Well, I mean, if it's helps you. the members, what we can do is schedule the um, representatives, the overarching bodies, um, and then once you've heard that evidence, you can decide whether you feel the need to hear from any of the individual insurance firms or not. Um, I think there's two overarching bodies. Yeah, there's the Forum for Insurance Lawyers, there's the CBI, and then there's the Association of um, British Insurers. You know, there's there's three there that I suspect we would want to hear from, and then if we can maybe schedule those and take a look at the others and decide if we're we're able to pair that back slightly. Yeah, there's two organisations I think that represent um, plaintiffs as well, which you would want to hear from. Yeah, I think you would want to hear from both of those. Okay. Well, listen, we, we leave it with me and we will organise because we, we want to start scheduling from the 27th of May. So we'll pick out we'll pick out a couple of those ones that we're definitely going to hear from and then we'll bring another paper back um, for next week to, to consider the others. But if you're content, we'll schedule a, a number of the key ones and then we'll take a look again if there's an opportunity to pair that back. Um, members, I assume, are content that we, we hear oral evidence both on stocking and damages, just to allow us to schedule things, um, as opposed to trying to close off the stocking bill before we move on to the damages bill. Um, we'll probably need to intermingle the two. Yeah, agreed. Okay. Um, okay, uh, that's fine. Christine, are you happy with that item being covered now? Yeah. I think there's anything. That's fine. Item 8, then, is the statutory rule, the damages order. So, pages 102 to 109, at our meeting on the 15th of April, the committee agreed that we were content with the proposed statutory rule amending the personal injury discount rate and that was required to be taken into account by courts in determining the amount of damages payable for future financial loss in personal mm -hmm. injury cases to minus 1.75%, that rate being calculated in accordance with the legal principles established by the House of Lords in Wales v Wales, the personal injury claimants are to be treated as very risk averse and the rate uh, should be set with reference to returns on index linked gilts. Uh, the statutory rule was laid by the Department of Justice on the 29th of April at subject to negative resolution. The Department advised that there has been no change to the policy content since the committee considered the SL1, the examiner for stat rules, um, reported on the technical scrutiny of the rule um, and that should be available for consideration in due course. So if members are content with the statutory rule subject to the findings of the examiner of statutory rules on the technical aspects of it, then I'll formally put the question uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2021 forward slash 115, the damages personal injury order Northern Ireland 2021. 
and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Um, item 9 on the agenda, the County Court Rules. The County Court Rules Committee proposes to make a statutory rule which will be subject to negative resolution procedure under Article 47 of the County Courts uh, Order 1980. The proposed rule has two purposes. It will allow for judgment to be obtained by a plaintiff on a summary basis for all or part of a claim after a notice of intention to defend has been lodged, which the Rules Committee considers would help to speed up proceedings. Uh, currently, there is no procedure for obtaining a summary judgment if a notice of intention to defend is lodged. It will also provide for costs in respect of the application and hearing. Secondly, it will make provision for provisional damages mirroring, as appropriate, the rules which apply in the High Court. Provisional damages are damages for existing injuries with the right of return to court to apply for further damages if serious deterioration is suffered in the future as a result of the original injury. And the Department has indicated that the County Court Rules Committee undertook a targeted consultation with key interested parties on the proposed rule, but it has not provided any information on who was consulted uh, or uh, if any issues were raised in response to that consultation. So if members are agreed, we will request details of the targeted consultation undertaken by the County Court Rules Committee and how any issues raised have been addressed. Uh, so, members, if we agree to that, then we will pick up the issue again. Agreed? Agreed. Item 10. Um, at our meeting on the 1st of October last year, the committee considered a proposal from the Department to introduce a statutory rule to, remo to remove the multiple conviction rule by which Access NI is required to automatically disclose all convictions relating to an applicant for standard and enhanced checks where that applicant has more than a single conviction held on their criminal record. This will bring the filtering scheme in line with the UK Supreme Court judgment in January 2019. That found uh, the disclosure of all convictions held on the criminal record where an individual had more than a single conviction was disproportionate and would not comply with Article 8 of the uh, ECHR. Uh, exemptions will remain in place where an offence is specified or where a conviction includes a penalty with a period of imprisonment. These offences will always be disclosed as long as they are retained on the police national computer. The changes regarding multiple convictions has operated on an administrative basis from 16th of March last year, and the rule provides the statutory basis for the change. In October, the committee was content with the proposal for the statutory rule, but had requested some clarity from the department on the offences that would be retained on the system permanently, which the department subsequently provided. The department has now written indicating that the rule was laid in the assembly on the 6th of May and explained that the delay following the committee's consideration was as a result of difficulties in agreeing its wording, which have now been resolved. The Department has also confirmed um, that there has been no change to the policy content of the rule since the committee considered uh, the issue in October, and has asked for confirmation that the committee is still content for the rule, which will be subject to a draft affirmative resolution process to be made. So, Members are at this stage asked to note the reasons for the delay in laying the rule uh, and advise uh, that uh, unless we were sure. yes, sorry. I don't. I don't know if it's you or if it's me, and I'm just wondering if everyone else can hear you okay. I'm alright, but uh, you're breaking up badly for me. Oh. Can everyone else hear okay? No. No, that's okay. Can I just check? Shadia, Doug, and Gemma, are you able to hear me? No. Chair, it was intermittent there for just a moment. I turned off my camera thinking it was my end, but no, I think it seems to have corrected. Okay, well, on the issue that I just read through, uh, which was amending the Police Act, what, what, it's not a decision to be taken on this. At this stage, we're just being asked to note um, the reason that there's been a delay in laying the rule, which we previously had said that we were content with. So unless there's any more clarity that we need, then th we will formally consider uh, the statutory rule when the report from the examiner for the rules is available. So if you're content on that item, we'll note that, and then we will yeah. deal with it um, formally. Agreed. Okay. Um, item 11, then, is the transfer of a statutory function relating to the uh, procedures of the Special Educational Needs and Disability Tribunal at our meeting on the 9th of June. Last year, the committee considered information from DOJ on a proposal to transfer the power to make changes to the procedural regulations that govern the practice of uh, special educational needs and disability tribunal from the Department of Education to the Department of Justice. The proposed transfer addresses an oversight that occurred when transfer of responsibility for this tribunal to the Department of Justice took place in 2011. 
and is being taken forward by the First Minister and Deputy First Minister by way of an order subject to the affirmative resolution procedures. Transfer of statutory functions require agreement from the Ministers of both departments and the relevant Assembly committees. The Committee had agreed that it was content with the proposed transfer of the function, and we wrote to the Department of Justice, the Committee of Education and the Committee for the Executive Office to advise them accordingly. The Committee for Education also advised that it was generally content for an order to be brought forward in respect of the transfer of responsibilities. Um, so the transfer of functions order has now been laid by the Executive Office in the Assembly on the 30th of April, and the Committee for the Executive Office has written asking if this Committee is content uh, with the statutory rule. Uh, the Committee for the Executive Office will be advised um, that the Committee um, is content with the transfer of the power to make changes to the procedural regulations that govern the practice um, of SENDIST, as the acronym from the Department of Education to the Department of Justice, unless we require any further information. If members are content with that, content. Content. Okay. Item 12. At our meeting on the 21st of January, the committee considered a letter from the minister outlining key points of the opinion she had received on the risk of repercussion in the legal aid schemes in other parts of the UK and to the legal aid schemes in Northern Ireland as a result of the legal aid provisions in the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act. The committee noted that work was continuing to assess and quantify the repercussive risks across the legal aid schemes and develop a plan to give effect to the legal aid, legal aid provisions in the Act and agreed to request an update on the due diligence work and the plan in three months' time. So the Department has now provided that update. It outlines that the necessary economic appraisal is being progressed in two phases. There is an initial strategic outline case to consider the repercussive risk and the available mitigations and to make a a uh, go no go decision on whether to commence the provision and subject to the outcome of that strategic outline case, then there will be a further outline business case deciding between the available options as to how implementation of the provisions will take place. The first full draft of the strategic outline case is now in the process of quality assurance within the department um, um, and is with the Department of Finance. Um, seeking their approval. Parallel work to develop evidential tests to be deployed in the criminal process and by judges when considering applications to prevent an alleged abuser uh, cross-examining their victim in court will be undertaken in consultation with relevant mm -hmm. stakeholders and provide the foundation for later work on the production by the Department of the Report to the Assembly of potential additional forms of support for victims of domestic abuse involved in family proceedings. So, members. Unless there is any more information that you are seeking, um, and let me bring in Linda Dillon and then Sinead Bradley. Linda, just a very quick question or a very quick proposal, Chair. That we can we ask the department do we have a timeline for the conclusion of this work? I say Sinead Norden. I think that's maybe the the same question. Just if we if we could have that. Yeah, I, I was going to suggest that we'd seek an update in terms of the timeline um, at the end of September. Is is where in terms they've given us details as to where they're currently moving, and I was going to then propose that we would get a full update in September um, as to where they've got to. But um, Sinead, is that the same point? Yeah, it, it just was around the time element because you know this started out as being a very simple piece that just had to be looked into, and now it has a formal structure that has two parts. You know, and then the letter suggests at the end actually a third part that it might then have to feed into a, a bigger piece of work. And I just fear that the timeline then somehow just becomes so blurred and lost in all of that. So I think it's important we pen it down, Chair, if we can. Thank you. Okay. Well. We'll do that. Um, we'll seek that update um, from the, the department. Okay, item 13. Then um, the department is proposing to undertake a 12-week consultation on the introduction of pro bono costs orders in line with the recommendations of the Access to Justice 2 and Gillen reviews. The proposals would allow an award of costs to be made against a party whose opponent was represented pro bono to help better ensure equality of arms. The department wants to explore with stakeholders how such a scheme could operate and whether there might be other means of increasing pro bono services. So, If members are content, we will um, note the proposed consultation. Uh, I was going to suggest we consider the matter further when the results and the proposed way forward are available. Um, and we can then pick the issue up again, unless there's any further points members wish to make. I see 
Sinead, your hands may be still up from last time. No, that's okay. Okay, members, then we will note the proposed consultation and we'll pick the issue up again whenever they come back with the results. Corres right. Correspondence. There's three items of correspondence um, in the meeting pack and one item in the uh, tabled pack. And I'll just draw attention to the correspondence in the tabled pack, and that was from the Committee for the Economy, asking whether this committee has undertaken or plans to undertake any work around the exercise of judicial uh, reviews. So, um, members, we, we haven't and we're not. So, I, if members are content, we'll respond to the Economy Committee advising that we have uh, not undertaken any work in relation to judicial reviews and we have no plans to do so, given the very heavy legislative programme that the Committee is currently scrutinising uh, and also uh, the other issues that we are responsible for within the Department of Justice, um, where we are seeking to do work in respect of that issue. Um, if members are content with that, and then we will action the, out the other items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. Agreed. Okay. I don't have any chairman's business. Is there any other business? And then we'll go back to the previous agenda item. Okay. So if there's no other business, um, then the last item on that agenda is the meeting that will take place next week at two o'clock, and that will be in room thirty. So that concludes the items on the agenda, with the exception of the or eleven session now with women's aid. So just as Sonia has taken her seat, um, we'll just go back to, to that aspect of it. So pages sixty-three to ninety-nine of the meeting pack members um, is the relevant um, papers. Sonia uh, McMullen is the regional services manager of Women's Aid Federation and is uh, joining us today. And you're very welcome, Sonia. As as always, um, we'll uh, record this session by Hansard. We'll publish a transcript of that then in due course. So, members, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sonia just to outline some of the key issues um, from her organisation's perspective in respect of uh, the bill, and then we will open that up for some uh, questions and discussions. So, Sonia, when you're ready, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and to the Justice Committee. Um, for giving us the opportunity to come along um, this afternoon to talk about the protection from stocking bill here in Northern Ireland. Um, I am from Women's Aid, as already outlined, and today I'll be speaking on behalf of our eight local women's aid groups across um, Northern Ireland. And hopefully I'll be able to um, portray the voices of the women within our services during the session. We'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the committee and acknowledge the considerable work that's been undertaken in the last year with the introduction of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. It's been a busy year for everyone, and now we're looking forward to a new piece of legislation. And we first presented um, this within our evidence for the domestic abuse legislation around stalking, so we really, really welcome that um, the new legislation, together with protection orders, will be there for this to protect these victims of crime. At present, we have the protection from harassment order, which I think um, many people will agree it's not fit for purpose at the moment in 2021. It's been 24 years since this legislation came into place, and really, I suppose we're talking about developments in online cyber abuse and technology, which everyone finds really difficult to keep up with and perpetrators of these crimes, they're, they're always a few steps ahead and the forms of abuse moving faster than anyone can really keep up with. The lack of definition within this legislation as well has also been a problem and the enforcement um, coming down to the police service and the lack of understanding around stalking and harassment as well has been an issue. But if you don't have legislation for um, stalking, um, you know, that's the problem. Our response to the Justice Committee has been informed by the local groups um, across Northern Ireland, as I said, the staff, volunteers, and a lot of consultation with our member service um, survivors, and including women, which we always do. And we, we did a, a brief piece of research um, for our evidence as well, entitled Women's Voices, and I hope the, the members of the committee had a chance to read that at the back of the, the evidence that we submitted. We welcome the proposed stalking bill, but also see it as an opportunity to change the response to domestic violence and abuse, and indeed all forms of violence against women and girls. And that's why 
in March of this year, we called um, and released a, a public petition for violence against women and girls strategy. And we would call on the Justice Committee today to hopefully support us in that. That is with the Executive Office at the moment. And I know we discussed this in length um, during the domestic abuse consultation, but stalking together with other forms of gender-based violence or crimes where women are disproportionately the victims. So I just, when I have the opportunity, wanted to raise that with the committee today, and hopefully we will have um, your support with that particular issue. I don't have to go over the, the rates of crime in relation to domestic violence. You all know that um, we have very, very high, staggeringly high statistics here in Northern Ireland. 17.5% of all crime reported to the PSNI is domestic violence related, and the PSNI respond to a domestic abuse incident every 17 minutes. But I suppose the most staggering statistic for me in the last year was this piece, which Alison Morris did on the 23rd of March. And there's a photo of eight women within the front of the Belfast Telegraph, and there are eight women that were murdered. And we have to really see the link and that causal link between domestic homicide and stalking. And, um, you know, we remember each and every one of those women who have lost their lives. So there's a link to domestic homicides, and we have to remember the use of stalking as a crime and the way of abusing a woman and the link to domestic homicide. And taking those learnings from reviews that have been undertaken in England and Wales, and also, we welcome the introduction of our domestic homicide reviews here, and we believe that um, the first homicide review will be um, beginning soon. But we'll have to see the link between stalking and the learnings from that. And according to the Crime Survey for England and Wales, almost one in five women over the age of 16 have experienced stalking. So huge statistics. Our PSNI statistics don't have any stalking-related crimes. We look at it in relation to harassment. But in the last year, the PSNI showed 3,880 offences in relation to harassment, which was a 26% increase, again staggeringly high. And it shows a major concern where there is not an appropriate mechanism to deal with the malicious communications and the cyber. Um, stalking and these kind of behaviours that we see that are often used in conjunction with other forms of domestic violence. And that brings us to that stalking link to domestic abuse. And there's much evidence to associate the link between domestic violence and abuse and stalking and coercive control. And there is a public misconception out there that it really is unnecessary, unwanted attention um, from an obsessive stranger, maybe somebody with a mental health issue, something like that. But we see so many different stalking behaviours. And whenever we did our, our piece of research for women in our service, you know, they told us about the unwanted and often persistent communication via text message, for example, and the cyber stalking, fake profiles being created, including social media exploitation, sharing of images online, being able to access everything, videos, for example, and even bank accounts and getting into, you know, it's really, really frightening um, how advanced and these perpetrators of stalking crime seem to be one step ahead all of the time. And that's why any legislation that we um, get in relation to stalking has to be fluid around that, um, those abusive behaviours and be able to adapt to the changes. Victims are followed to work, are monitored, their daily movements tracked, you know, um, sometimes having to leave or being disciplined in work, for example, because of the stalking behaviours. Following victims home, sometimes to find out where they live, waiting outside, you know, even women's aid resource centres, leaving gifts for women. And this is a huge one for us because it's awful mis misconstrued by PSNI, for example, in the courts as being a nice gesture. But usually these gifts are a way of reminding the victim of the perpetrator's presence. Also contacting friends and family to get information and installing covert cameras, listening devices in the home. And a new one that we got whenever we did this piece of research was drones being used, you know, over people's houses. So um, really, really frightening the lengths that people will go to to film um, and stalk and harass people. So any new legislation should provide and afford greater clarity to all, including police officers, lawyers, judges, magistrates, very similar to the domestic abuse bill with regard to that mandatory obligation for training that we called upon. 
Um, and we would stress that a new law alone won't improve the lives of stalking victims without successful awareness um, campaigns. Stalking by ex-partners is a big issue that came up for us. And um, again, to reiterate, the women are more likely to suffer serious harm or homicide when they're stalked, especially where there's a previous or current intimate partner relationship with a stalker. And again, that's the importance of our judiciary and our police service knowing um, those kind of stalking behaviours and the high risk indicators that there are. Um, stalking by ex-partners who are domestic abusers is one of the most common forms of stalking and it's the cornerstone of stalking is control. In some cases it's a combination of both or fluctuates between two. So again, you know, that post-separation, we know that domestic violence doesn't you know, end at that point of separation and often people are at most danger whenever they have left or are leaving their relationship. We welcome the discussion around stock and protection orders and we feel the current system it doesn't give legal protection to victims of harassment and certainly not stalking. So this proposal would have a really positive impact on victims of stalking, faster access to protective orders um, through reporting stalking to the police rather than having to maybe apply to the court themselves. But there is an issue around the costs and will the costs sit with the victim or the police service or, or who will that um, sit with because nobody should have to pay for protection. It would give stalking victims in Northern Ireland similar protections to, to those in other jurisdictions and it would prevent stalker um, behaviour escalating and it would hopefully encourage more people to come forward which is really all that we want. Um, in addition to banning perpetrators from approaching or contacting victims, the orders can also force stalkers to seek professional help. But where are those behavioural management programmes? If we look at mental health programmes, addiction services in Northern Ireland, um, those kind of things that are, are being looked at and discussed uh, within the context of this legislation, who would manage them and who would monitor that? And where is the resources coming for that? So that's just something we would be concerned about. Interim orders are great as well as they provide that immediate protection for victims while a decision is being made and it would further help protect victims. We would also support the need for a register of serial perpetrators of domestic violence and stalkers as well and we would um, really like the committee to consider that. And just briefly then I'd like to introduce the Northern Ireland context because I think it's really important and if you know within the evidence you will see that there were several women um, spoke very bravely around their stories around um, paramilitary links and it um, it was quite shocking and for somebody who's worked in women's aid for almost 25 years it was really really worrying that these communities still there's still such a hold on them and women living in such fear and distress with covert cameras, you know, being put in neighbours' houses, for example, and many, many lists of, of the control um, that still takes place from an ex-partner. And that fear that actually they can't leave and there's no way out, and it's very difficult. And a huge vulnerability for the woman coming forward to tell their story. And I even feel a, a huge vulnerability even sharing it. Um, and, and the women's aid groups that support these women as well, the risk that that puts them under too. And I cannot underestimate it enough. And we spoke to a number of women um, confidentially who shared their experiences. And they were very frightened sharing their experiences. But, um, you know, the use of firearms. Um, I remember whenever I did start in Women's Aid all that time ago, you would have heard that a lot. Illegal, legal and illegal firearms being used, you know, um, um, as something to frighten and cause fear. But... Um, some of the stalking behaviours included cameras being installed, you know, in neighbours' houses. Some have had death threats being watched and monitored, you know, cars just sitting outside their house. Um, and stalking behaviours also continue whenever partners are in prison. You know, one woman telling me um, her partner who was in prison ringing her and saying, why weren't your curtains open at 10 o'clock to 10 o'clock this morning? You know, in prison and still having that level of control over an individual is really, really frightening. So I just wanted to raise that issue. And also, of course, the cross-border issue then with regard to the stalking. And, you know, if you live in, um, you know, 
um, Newry and your stalkers in Monaghan, or you live in Letterkenny or your stalkers in Derry, that kind of thing. And, and it is an issue with regard to um, those border areas. Training as well, we, we can't emphasise enough, and I know we talked so much about this within the bill, and, and we would like a similar model replicated with regard to that ma mandatory obligation for training. Because there's so much learning around this to actually understand the process of um, stalking and the behaviours. So we would call you know, on the need for specialist training. Public awareness campaign, absolutely, we would encourage that. Um, but we would agree that there's, um, you know, in conclusion, there's significant potential benefits to introducing this law. Of course there is. And we know that it didn't fit within the domestic abuse bill and we welcome that it's getting a separate piece of legislation. And we feel it will support victims and survivors of stalking. You know, we do an awful lot of risk assessment, safety plan, and emotional practical support for, for victims of stalking, and we really see the impact that that can have. And for us, it's getting across those seemingly minor behaviours that in conjunction cause fear and alarm to victims. And importantly, intent should not have to be proven. And this is a huge thing in relation to breaches of orders, for example, and we just wanted to raise it in relation to stalking. But instead, objective, reasonable test applied. A victim's reaction of fear and alarm and the reasonableness of that fear, given the context of the relationship between the victim and the stalker, that should be central to the offence. We have talked about um, public awareness campaigns to dispel myths, training among police, judges, prosecutors, legal professionals, for example, reiterating the urgent need for those protection, protective measures through the orders. But again, looking at the cost, and this, you know, legislation on its own is only part of tackling um, stalking. There's much further work that needs to be done to raise awareness and tackle both cultural and behavioural issues and change societal views. So we're back to that education piece, which has been discussed so much over the last few months, especially around the violence against women and girls strategy after the tragic murder of Sarah Everard and you know, our own murders closer to home as well. So it's essential, and we hope that the Justice Committee take the time to talk to victims and survivors like you have done, and listen, which you, you have done previously. You've really listened, and let them tell and voice their stories of what, of what it's like to live um, in fear of a stalker. So thank you, and that ends my... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sonia, and that's a very comprehensive... Um, overview that you've provided, and, and again, thank you for the work that your organisation does. Um, vital. Um, I'm going to bring in members, and then I'll pick up any issues that isn't covered. So, if I can bring in Vice Chair of the Committee, Linda Dillon, in the first instance. Linda. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sonia, for your presentation. As the Chair said, it's 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 a very comprehensive presentation, and we appreciate you coming to the committee today on on this issue and. You know, particularly some of the, the things you've just outlined around that where, where it crosses over really with that course of control pace and, and the domestic abuse. And we are aware there will be crossover, but I still think that having the two pieces of legislation is, is was probably the, the best way for us to go forward. And but I absolutely think that this should complement each other. And again, that speaks to the importance of training and understanding of all of these pieces of legislation. And that is vital. And, and I outlined this to the, the Human Rights Commissioner who was in here in before, just before you came in, that we will be putting the same emphasis as a committee around training, monitoring, making sure we're collecting data and that we're you know, improving where improvements are needed and making sure that any mistakes or anything that is not right or has not been implemented correctly is addressed. So just to give you that reassurance as, as a committee that we will be um, very focused on that piece of work as, as we were in the domestic abuse bill and I, I, I would be certainly intend that we take the same approach to the the stalking bill. J just a few wee points that I want to um, both sort of tease out with you on here and ask you around the, the the relation to the dash that take place to get you know the rollout of training in relation to the dash sorry the or in the PSNA, I'm just wondering. You've raised that, but I'm wondering. Do you have an idea of how that issue can be resolved, and is it a case of that it requires better training 
and better resourcing, which is something that we'd be asking for anyway? Or is there something else that you think needs to happen around that? If you don't mind, Chair, I'll get an answer to that before I move on to the next no problem. Yeah, okay. I, I just think it's interesting when we have a tool, we have a dash form, which is mm -hmm. domestic abuse, stalking and honour based violence. And mm -hmm. I, I did try to get some information and data from the place, but given that, you know, it was very um, short time, um, but I'd love to get that piece of research to see how often those extra questions are used. You know, and it probably would involve, you know, you have a very good, robust tool. I know the the dash form is currently being, a new one is being piloted, but it's currently reviewed all of the time. And it would be really useful to look at that and then pull it out and do a piece of training. You know, the police are going through a huge piece of training in relation to course of control, and it could be something that could be added to all new recruits training. And um, certainly then for um, women's aid, I think we would use the questions more often. You know, I just did a a bit of a ask of you know a lot of our support workers and a lot of them would use it um, but it, I think you know as a tool it's something that is there there's no point in reinventing the wheel for a new assessment and um, I think it would just be be looking at um, how we can introduce it and put it into um, for example new recruit training and then refresher training for the PSNI as one of the biggest producers of the dash form you know as an organization Together with Women's Aid, I think the two of us are the, the biggest providers of dash forms through to Marek. Can I suggest, Chair, just in relation to that, that we as a committee write to both the policing board and the chief constable and ask that that is addressed? And and, and, and I think we should even suggest that they, they are having some conversations with Women's Aid about how best to address that and, and take their steer and their advice on it. Not to tell them how to do their job, but I mean, we all look to those who have the expertise in these areas to, to give us some advice. And I don't think that um, they should be any different. I, I just think that, that issue should be addressed. If it doesn't need, we don't need any further work on the legislation, we should ensure that it is being used to its best potential. Um, the next issue then that I just want to raise with you, Sonia, the, you had said that the SPOs are not appropriate for a child under 16, and just for the record, I agree with you. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas of how, what type of interventions would be appropriate for maybe children who do engage in behaviours that, that could be construed as, as um, stalking behaviours? Those, those young people that are under the age of 16 and, and I'm not wanting to put you on the spot if, if you know if you don't have any ideas but you think it's just something that needs to be looked at by the department then I, I'm, I'm okay with that but I'm just wondering if you do have any ideas of interventions that may be used. Well I think yeah we don't support the criminalisation of younger people. I know the age of criminal responsibility is 10 in Northern Ireland. I feel that's far too young and we that's for another day you know and another discussion but it's all back to education, isn't it, and behavioural programmes. And if we look to see what programmes actually are out there for young boys or young girls that feel they have these behaviours, they're worried about their anger, their challenging behaviours. And we all know that um, not every young person grows up in a home where there is a healthy relationship. And that's why we're back to really good, robust RSE. And we discussed that at length within the domestic abuse bill. I know there's the training and awareness subgroup within the Gillen review as well. You know, there's a lot of work ongoing in relation to this. And let's hope that, um, you know, it has to be a societal change, you know, a whole change of attitude. And, you know, we need to give our young people an opportunity. And that is through, and it's not all up to education. It's really not, you know. And um, it's up to um, public awareness campaigns as well. But I don't feel we have um, strong enough behavioural management programmes for children and young people who are identifying worrying behaviours. You know, and again, that's back to investment and resourcing. But um, a lot of it, you know, does lie with education and looking at healthy relationship programmes, equality, trust, you know, um, 
so all of the things that we have within. We have a wonderful post-primary healthy relationship programme. But again, it's ad hoc. It's just whatever schools let you in. And, you know, we have this problem around our Board of Governors and um, parents' opposition to um, some of the programmes. So there's an awful lot of work to be, be done in relation to that. But there's an awful lot of work ongoing at the moment. We'll have to, you know, so... Sorry, Linda, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did, and, and you probably said exactly what I would have been thinking myself, but I just wanted to make sure. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't always like to think that, that I know it all, and I want to be sure that I'm, that I'm right in what I'm thinking, but I, I do agree with you, and I mean, can't stress enough the importance of, of RSE and, and of that education piece, and I don't intend to labour on it because I'm sure the committee members are, are better up listening to me around education and, and everyone around me, but I just see it as such a vital, vital tool and so important. Um, the last thing that I just want to raise is the SPOs carrying, uh, the, the breaches rather, sorry, of SPOs carrying a maximum sentence of six months in this piece of legislation and um, Women's Aid think that should be extended to 12 months. I don't disagree with you for two reasons. Again, I, I outlined them to the Human Rights Commissioner. First is, is it long enough? You know, because very, very often, or very rarely actually, do we ever see the maximum sentence for anything used. So, you know, you really are talking about if six months is the maximum, what are people actually going to receive in terms of a sentence? And I'm a wee bit concerned about that. Um, and also in terms of rehabilitation, what opportunity do you get to rehabilitate somebody if they're sentenced to, to four or eight weeks in, in any real way? And, and the truth of it is, you're right, around the programmes and the, the behaviour programmes, I personally don't think there's, I, I, I don't know of any in my area. And I'm not saying they're not there, but I don't know of them. And if I don't know of them, what hope is there for anybody else? Um, but we know that there are there is plenty of good work going on within our prison system, which is a, a sad indictment of of us as a as a society and as an assembly that you almost have to go to jail before you get the support that you need. But we do know that it's there, that there are some really good programmes within our, our prison system and the rehabilitation system. So I suppose just in terms of the the six months or twelve months, that's my view of it. I'm just Wanting, you've, you've given your position that you think it should be extended to 12. I just want to give you this opportunity to, to outline why. Yeah, I think the, the orders, I suppose for any sentence under six months, there is no rehabilitation that takes place within the prison You know, for that individual. So I suppose where is the learning there and where is the change going to happen within that behaviour? Where is the opportunity for that person to... Um, mm -hmm. have um, that form of programme. But as you say, the maximum sentences are so very rarely used that that's why I think it's key that we have really good, robust um, judiciary training in relation to this to look at the high extent and that link between um, domestic homicide and stalking. You know, we can't underestimate it enough. But mm -hmm. it's back to those rehabilitation programmes. And I know within the Domestic Abuse Bill and within this, we talk about those um, you know, other things that could be used, you know, they reference the mental health programmes and the addiction programmes, and, and a lot of those are going to be run by the voluntary sector, mm. you know, really. And who's going to be monitoring and overseeing the commitment to those programmes? And uh, really good, robust um, rehabilitation behavioural management programmes, which we just don't have, as you say, at the moment. And the resources um, haven't been there maybe for that. And you know, for any piece of legislation to work, it has to have money behind it, and it has to have resources and investment, or we're just going to go around in circles again. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you in relation to that, Sonia. And appreciate you coming to the committee, Chair. I, I thank you for that opportunity to ask the questions. Just to say that I have to leave the meeting just before four o'clock, so. I would say you, you probably won't be finished by that time, Sonia, but just to say thank you and I apologise for having to leave early and to the, to the chair of the committee just to make you aware of that. So thank you very much for that, Sonia. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Linda. Um, Sinead Bradley, if I can bring you in at this stage. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sonia, um, for not just your presentation, but your very detailed paper. Um, Sonia, 
You've raised some really good questions. You know, if we're pointing to part of the solution being that whole behavioural um, model, then of course we need to know that it's there. You know, those um, those um, are in place. But I, like Linda said, you know, I'm not overly aware. That's not to say they don't exist, and and maybe it doesn't necessarily need to be advertised that they exist. But we need to know they're there and that there's direct access to them and they're working. Um, so, and I, I'm going to start by looking at the the, um, the point you made about the amendments and the register of um, persistent behaviours. Um, and I appreciate that that type of a proposal would capture persistent offenders. But my concern would be the number of cases that maybe don't reach conviction that also have a pattern of persistent offenders. Um, and for maybe maybe somebody very good at manipulating the system, or like you said, almost a step ahead of it. Um, so I, I do think there's a piece of work, and it's certainly something I would like to explore further. And I appreciate you raising that. But I'd also like to know, Sonia, in terms of the um, the Women's Aid Federation and, and the the offices that you're representing. Have you, or is there any note, noticeable change in the type of cases that are coming forward? And what I'm alluding to here is in terms of, is there more online activity being reported to you and or digital um, type of abuse and stalking? And also, has there been any um, reflection that the, the the bill as it is now is going to capture or pin down the stories that you're hearing and, and I really appreciate it because I know um, Sonia it's it's in your telling of their stories and we did have the opportunity to hear victims uh, previous and no doubt will again but it, they are the they are the experiences that bring this to life and make us realize how important it is we get it right and they were pinning down the right points. And we have put already a lot of thought and slant towards the digital part. So I want to be absolutely sure that that, that is reflecting what is coming through your doors now. And also to have an idea of, I, I'm really uncomfortable with how limited we are here in terms of um, orders only being able to be given to people who are in Northern Ireland or have arrived in Northern Ireland, uh, would you have any evidence to suggest that that's not going to cut it? I don't want to preempt it, that. I'd like to know if, if that is real on the ground stuff that, that we would have an effect. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. In relation to the noticeable change, yes, we have seen a, a real noticeable change in relation to the cyber stalking. You know that online abuse and that's what i said in that that first step the presentation about they're always one step ahead you know with regard to the tracking you know we've been encouraging women to go to the garage and get their cars lifted up underneath because the tracking devices that's the only way you find them you know because people just start to think am i going mad what's going on here but they are being tracked you know so i'm very creative in the way that people are um, being able to hack but hack into bank accounts and things like that which are really really dangerous also a lot of images being um, posted you know or superimposing um someone else's body on you know but they're um um very difficult you know images that are being shared as well um, images may have been um, you know taken with consent and then shared without consent on online platforms so definitely um, the list goes on and on with regard to that and as I said the drones that was a new one with regard to you know just sitting over the top of your garden or over your house all the time you know that kind of thing but the online abuse is is really really worrying and I know um, from conversations with um, the police as well it is something that they're finding very challenging as well and I suppose in relation to the actual um, clauses and the definition within the bill that's why I said in relation to if you look at the protection from harassment order you know 1997 it's really really aged there was none of this you know it talks about phone calls and messages being left you know and it doesn't reflect today's society at all and that's why we need something that is fluid, that talks about a uh, list that isn't exhaustive of behaviours. 
that you can develop and uh, you know um, and interpret that within the legislation because you couldn't name them all. You know, there's just so many, and um, and we can't keep up with it. To be honest, it's really really difficult. But there is a huge increase in relation to that um, form of abuse. So you don't physically need to be present in a room with someone to be carrying out and instilling fear and distress. And that's something that we can't um, emphasize enough. And that's very out of your control um, as well. And um, the, the second part of your question, I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I thought I, I had just, written it down. No, 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 I know it's really loud. I do that. I just like to, even if you just want to add a wee bit of your thoughts on the registers and the amendments that were put in place around the register. Yeah, I think the register is something that we would be very passionate about in Women's Aid. Certainly around domestic abuse, we see it as it's a repeat crime. It really, really is. And that was one of the, the reasons why we really pushed that. And I suppose on the back of the domestic abuse bill in Westminster and all the support you know, that has been around a register for serial perpetrators. And of course, we always want to capture those people that um, aren't in women's aid services, that aren't known to social services or the police. They're always the people. But let's hope by getting all of this new legislation in place, place that more people will come forward. You know, and that's why what we want from a violence against women and girls strategy too, because you talked about, um, our Linda talked about collecting the data. We don't know how many people are, you know, being stalked here in Northern Ireland because we don't have legislation. Nobody is collecting data around stalking because we don't have, you know, um, that data set within our PSNI, and so, you know, we need to see the true picture in relation to all forms of violence against women and girls, I feel, because that's the only way we can make a difference if we don't know what we're dealing with. Yeah, thank you. No, Sonia, I fully agree with that. And I think, you know, um, obviously, you know, you have our support in terms of the strategy, but you're right, it's the data set because, you know, with all our best intentions, why we would like to get every bill right first time, if we're not collecting the data along along the way to find out, you know, the cases that have come forward and the tracking of them through the system, and if they don't reach conviction, why not? You know, maybe that they shouldn't, or that there was a breakdown in in the legislation or the burden of tr of proof. And um, so, I, yeah, I think it's it's a conversation that we really need to open up now and um, to capture the data along the way. And um, I suppose the register is the ultimate final piece in terms of repetitive behaviour, but repetitive behaviour could have happened further upstream that would never make it to a register. So I'd be conscious to just think further on that um, and see how we can capture as much along the way as we can. Sonia, thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And Sinead covered one of my questions on that serial um, offender register type issue, so I uh, appreciate Sinead doing that. There's no other members have indicated, so um, Sean, yeah, can I thank you? Um, I'm sure there'll be issues that we're going to come back to you on in due course, um, but I appreciate you coming to the committee today. Okay, thank um, you. Members are content. We will follow up on the points that Linda made in terms of contacting the police board um, uh, in respect of those issues, and we can do that and we'll pick up on those, so thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Well, you know, we moved through all of the other agenda items when we had a 15-minute section, so there's no other business to conclude today's session. So, thank you for your attendance, and the meeting is now adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.